Okay, hello everybody. I think that's time. Uh, thank you for coming. And um, my name is Jarek Wukov, and this is Łukasz Łukasiewicz. And we are going to tell you something about how we use Zool at Tungsten Fabric. So, uh, yeah. Let's start with some introduction. Uh, we are uh, admins and operators of the Tanks and Fabrics continuous integration and continuous build system. Uh, we started deploying Zool version 3 in November last year. So we already have uh, a journey with Zool that lasts for, for one year. Uh, we both work at Codylime, which is a, a Polish company based in Warsaw, and uh, we offer uh, DevOps, SDN, NFV, and cloud native services and consulting. Uh, we employ about uh, 200 engineers uh, who consume about uh, 50,000 of coffee shots per year. And in case uh, you want to contact us after the talk, here are our email addresses. So uh, let's start with some background about our project. Uh, Tungsten Fabric, uh, some of you may know it under the former name Open Contrail. Uh, this is a SDN framework uh, that is multi stack in a sense that it integrates with uh, many kinds of uh, workload orchestrators. Uh, the, pri the first one and the, one of the primary ones is OpenStack, uh, but we also uh, can provide uh, virtual networking for Kubernetes and OpenShift, VMware, Hyper V and also connect to uh, clouds, public clouds. So uh, because we, we integrate with OpenStack, we face uh, similar challenges like the OpenStack CI, because we need to test the software against uh, different versions of OpenStack, for example. And uh, the specifics of our project is that we use uh, very many uh, programming languages. Uh, we have C, C++, we have uh, a uh, kernel module for packet forwarding, for example. Uh, we have Go, Python, Java, and others as well. Um, we have uh, a single build of uh, all the core components, and this uh, requires checking out uh, 30 repos into one build tree and making the build. Uh, for this, we are using the Android repo tool, which, che which checkouts all the projects, and it was not that trivial to integrate it into Zool, uh, because Zool uh, does all the, all the code checkout by, by itself, but we managed to do it. And um, after the build, uh, we need to create um, Docker images, because the tungsten services are deployed as containers. And we support um, a couple of platforms. Uh, we mostly focus on CentOS. Uh, and the Red Hat family, but we also have Windows Server and in some places a few, uh, few Ubuntu images. Okay, so let's um, talk about how the build system looks like and what's the history. So the starting point uh, before we migrated to the CI to Zool version 3, uh, we had a, um, Tungsten had a um, continuous build system um, on Jenkins. And um, it was a totally separate system from the continuous integration system. So it had um, a duplicated set of scripts, duplicated locations of dependencies, and a different set of slaves for building. So it required um, a lot of uh, manual uh, synchronization because uh, it, when some important things changed in the code, the, the build scripts had to be uh, synchronized between this continuous integration system and the Jenkins uh, continuous build system. The build system worked, it worked well, but it required some, some more work. So while, while migrating to the CI to Zool version 3, uh, we had an idea to use the same jobs that we use in continuous integration for testing to uh, power our release pipeline. So, um, so we managed to, to do it, and right now the tungsten release system uh, runs entirely on Zool. And uh, the build pipeline consists of three steps. Uh, we first compile uh, the code and package it to RPM packages. 
Then we build uh, Docker images, and then we publish it to whatever registries we we want. So we have a we have a three step uh, three step uh, uh, daily uh, daily build pipeline. And to give you some more details, we have one Zool job that builds and packages the software. We upload it to um, RPM repo that is hosted on Nexus. Uh, then a second job fires, which has a dependency on the build job. So it starts after the first one succeeds. Uh, we, uh, we provide the URL to the repo, uh, to the package repo using Zool return. So the, the image building job uses the Ansible variable to install the RPM repo, the YAM repo in uh, the container. And uh, the container step in turn uh, uploads the images to a temporary registry. And the published job fetches uh, the containers and publishes it to, uh, to external, external sources where, where you can download the, the images. Uh, we are not using or not planning currently to use the job pausing feature. We have the, the RPM repo and the temporary registry are living on a static node. And we think that uh, it is a good solution for us because it reduces the load on the system. We don't need to have uh, a VM running because during the during the build we still need to uh, retain the retain the images and retain the packages. So uh, this way or another we need to upload them to some static registry. So we are not planning to to use the the, the VM from the first job, for example, to host the RPM repo. Okay, so this is uh, this is one one uh, swim lane of building stuff, but we are building stuff for different platforms and for different versions of software. So we need to have uh, multiple of them. So for example, for one, uh, for one platform, in this case, uh, uh, OpenStack, uh, particular OpenStack version, we run it uh, as, a, as a one pipeline. And when I say pipeline, I mean a, a workflow of jobs, not the pipeline in the Zool sense. So we have one, uh, uh, one sequence of jobs uh, that finish with publishing. And then we, uh, we run them multiple times for, uh, uh, for different versions and for different platforms. And we even have one, uh, one quirk that we are, we are still using Jenkins under the hood to build some Windows containers. And this is just uh, just a Zool job that triggers Jenkins and then waits until it finishes and then downloads the containers and publishes them uh, to to a registry. Of course, we are planning to to use the uh, the wind uh, notable Windows integration to incorporate this entirely into Zool version three. But this is a, a temporary solution. Uh, okay, to be like to give you the full information, we of, we, of course we are using mirrors of different. Uh, different artifacts. We have RPMs, we have DEPs, we have PyPy, Cache, Maven, and uh, Docker images also. As for the Builder VM images, we, um, we took the minimal approach. So we don't install any dependencies on the notable, uh, notable images. We are using a plain operating system based image. We only install Zool SSH keys and all the dependencies are installed during build so that we are sure that we maintain all the dependency configuration inside the source, source repos and not in the, not in the disk image builder uh, defi uh, image definitions. And uh, it was kind of disappointing for devs when we were explaining it that um, the, the disk image builder uh, and the elements uh, mechanism is not a way to cache builds. Because it's important for me, it's important to think about the disk image builder um, definitions as an infrastructure thing. We are providing images for different uh, operating systems, for CentOS, for Ubuntu, but this is not, uh, we, you, you can't like um, submit a review with changes to node pool configuration and then test how the, how the job will behave uh, with your change. So this, it's not possible to change the, the image definition and see how your jobs run with it. You need to merge it, you need to wait for this image builder to build it and then only then you can see uh, how, it's, how it's behaving. So, uh, so we are not doing any, any like build artifacts caching or dependency caching inside the images. And, uh, 
uh, now you know how we, uh, how we configure the jobs, so it's important to, to, to say how we are triggering the, the events. Uh, so uh, one way of doing this is a, a scheduled, uh, scheduled trigger in Zool. So of course we use it to build uh, um, a nightly, daily nightly builds. And when the release is approaching, we, uh, we change it to, to build to start uh, twice a day. And on every merge, um, we are we are triggering uh, build uh, pipelines for uh, for documentation and also for th for third party RPM packages uh, for our dependencies. So we have uh, we have a cached um, cached repo of dependencies built from RPM specs, and. Um, we, it is also possible to trigger the build on demand, for example, when something failed, uh, and Zool administrator is able to, to, trigger, to trigger the build using the CLI. Okay, to, to make, the, to make the, the build system a little bit more useful and to give a better interface for users, uh, we provided some extensions. And all the things that I will be talking about are just uh, things that we wrote in Ansible and in Python. We, we didn't change Zool in any way. So the first thing was uh, consecutive build numbers. Uh, we have a requirement from in the release process that every daily build has an uh, incrementing build number. Uh, so for every, for every branch that we build, we have a sequence of uh, build numbers. And uh, we are also dumping exact commit information into JSON files so that we uh, are able to see what was included in the build and uh, also to reproduce the build in case we want to test something. Uh, we are dumping information about artifacts, so for example, Docker images and, um, and their IDs for later verification. And from the um, commit information lists, we are generating uh, tables of changes that um, went into the, the current build, and also a list of bugs. So the, the, um, the build number feature uh, is written as a custom Ansible module that is using a um, SQL database. And for every um, for every branch, we we are uh, saving the the list of the, the mappings between Zool build set IDs and the build numbers. And uh, I think uh, I'm um, for me it is it is a kind of a persistent Zool return. So we are kind of saving va saving values returned from from Zool build sets for later ref reference. And also, we are using the, the build number thing to uh, we change the way uh, Zool is uh, generating log URLs. So we have a list, uh, we have a directory with all the all the build logs for for every branch. And for dumping uh, commit information, we have a JSON structure that for each project used in the nightly build set, we have a list of changes, uh, commits, shays, and uh, uh, change numbers in Garrett are also there. And in case the, uh, the commit referenced some launchpad bag bug, it's also, uh, the information is also there. So we can generate the tables and the developers can see what happened in the last build using this. And uh, uh, yes, so yeah, as I said, this is uh, this is everything is entirely implemented in Ansible. So we are running um, running post playbooks to um, to generate all the all the information and upload it to the log server. Okay, and so this was the the build pipeline, but we started with uh, uh, with implementing the jobs to for a check pipeline. And uh, we use exactly the same jobs. Um, the jobs inside are aware of the differences in the um, environment variables. So for example, we detect that we are not running against a change, uh, but we are running against a ref. And uh, we detect that we are running in a nightly pipeline, for example. And uh, the jobs select, the, for example, the place to upload artifacts, uh, depending on the information that comes from the Zool environment. Uh, the, we don't need a publish step in the check pipeline when testing code. Uh, so we dropped the, the publish job and uh, 
we we perform we perform the build and then uh, we perform the build using the same jobs as in nightly uh, pipeline and then we run a suite of integration tests for different different platforms from the same uh, from the same artifacts that are built in the um, uh, container uh, building job. Uh, okay, so um, we are we can also benefit from the fact that um, that we split the jobs into two because we can perform the the package build once and then use the artifacts in in multiple uh, image building jobs, for example. And Zool also made it made it easier t for us to. Um, integrate uh, job done by different teams so all the all the components here were written by by different teams we um, made some changes to the build process uh, and the packaging process uh, one of the teams prepared the uh, the tool for building containers and the QA team prepared all the all the test suits and Zool made it easy for us to integrate the job and to synchronize different teams to get to get to this point. Uh, okay, so this was a description of uh, the build system, and I will now hand the mic to Lucas, and he will tell you about some of the findings along the way. Thanks. All right. So um, I want to share something about reusing Zool jobs today. Um, it's all fine, except the fact that we want to reuse Zool jobs. We wanted to reuse Zool jobs outside of Zool. And the original idea was that we already have jobs that are shared between the CI and the CB system. So the majority of the work is done. We decided that perhaps we can use that in the development environment for our devs to make it easier for them. So we decided, okay, so let's focus on that and create some sort of Zool agnostic playbooks and roles, so they will be completely decoupled from Zool. We wanted to do it so because uh, Tungsten Fabric is rather an extensive project. We have a lot of repos that are tightly coupled together, and we, if you want to get a full build, you actually need to check out all of them and then run the build. So uh, at the same time, we wanted to do it for the developers so it will become very easy for them. It will be like one-click solution. We wanted to save us the time because we already wrote the jobs. And at the same time, it's really cool to reuse the stuff you already written because, well, doing something twice is not, not fancy. And at the time, we approached at some sort of a dilemma because we, as I said, we wanted to have reusable playbooks that we can write in Zool. But at the same time, we wanted to focus mainly on Zool's variables because, well, they're just convenient. They're there. You can use Zool change or any other variable to tag your stuff or actually uh, generate links to the builds. And at the same time, there is another dilemma because you want to have very good array visibility for the developers to actually be able to debug their job, see which, which exactly step has failed and what do they need to do. And it becomes a little bit harder if you want to put all of that in the CI system and be dependent. So you want to have like one single shell entry point very similar to what OpenStack infra team did for the migration between Zool 2.5 to 3.0. And of course, I, I want to say that the idea failed. Uh, because run a playbook has to do all the work that we require. Uh, what that means, that all the building or packaging has to stick inside of run. And because of that, we cannot properly leverage pre and post playbooks. Pre and post playbooks, uh, they're very good to use in Zool. They're very convenient. They allow you, for instance, to retry your job if they fail in the very beginning, or upload logs because, well, this is like the last step you need to do. However, it's very hard to tell and to actually tag your stuff in a way that you are able to say, okay, so this pre-playbook is very Zool specific, but this pre-playbook actually installs our dependencies. One other issue is that I believe that Ansible is too well integrated into Zool. And what I mean by that is the fact that it's so convenient and easy to use Zool variables inside of Ansible that you 
don't actually want to create some sort of abstraction layer for your variables and well basically you just use zool change or zool patch set, build set and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. One other issue is that uh, if you want to leverage pre and post playbooks you need to actually know which one of them you need to run. And this is something that implicates that you actually need to parse zool config on your own because you need to see what the job you need to run later on see what parent this job has and go over every single parent to the very very top of the tree to see what pre post and run playbooks you have over there and combining all of that and then the decision of which playbooks are uh, zool related which are not it, it, it actually is a lot of work so aftermath of that is that we decided to move all the packaging building logic to make files inside our code repos. So we have repos with the code, we have make files, we have all the build steps over there. It's, it becomes simple. However, uh, since we actually wanted to reuse some stuff and um, not do it twice, we decided to create some sort of make files that will allow it to uh, that will allow us to do it a little bit in an easier way. So in case of the CB or CI system, we normally run pre-playbooks, later on we, we start with run. However, w there is a huge difference between the dev environment and the uh, playbook, and the run playbook. Uh, dev environment ha runs target called make all, which basically will install all of your dependencies, all of the stuff you need, and run all the targets at the same time. However, since we really, really, really hard wanted to be, uh, wanted to still keep the ability to split the jobs inside ARA and be visible, we run something like target list. It generates a list of targets available. We save that to uh, Ansible variable. Later on, we have another tasks, another task that basically includes a different file with some. Uh, with the list of, of the targets, and basically we include the we include the file for every single for every single target, and that way it is well visible in ARA. And from the dev environment perspective, as I said, post playbooks like logs or package upload are not really important. This is only something that sticks uh, at the developer's laptop, so they are not really interested in that. Uh, and now I want to focus on uh, testing your jobs because your jobs are already stored in your repos as a code. So in theory, you should be able to test them like everything else you want to test in Zool. However, there are some things that are um, not very easily testable in Zool and there is a very good reason for that. And what I mean by that is are secrets. Secrets are a very difficult part of Zool because you want to have a system that allows you to be as open as possible and have as few operator ingresses as possible. So you don't want operator to be administering the system. You don't want you actually want the administrator to operate the infrastructure, not the system itself. So, and um, because of that, you allow secrets to be created by every single user. However, you need to make sure they are not readable by every single user. So you cannot test if the secret you want to add before actually merging the code to your trusted repo works or not. So you can take the risk, merge it blindly, or try to do something else. Uh, we have a few ideas for testing your jobs actually. So you can start with setting all of your pipelines or the pipelines you want to test your staff as post review. Uh, I would recommend that only in the envir in environments that are not security focused. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I would say something rather like 10 people company and uh, like knowing each other for over 15 years. That's a pretty good scenario for that. Uh, Another, another example would be a separate development environment. So separate development environment, I mean by that setting another Zool, Gary, Notepool, and all of the components needed for, run, for running your CI system. Uh, this has a huge disadvantage. Uh, 
you still need to uh, clone your repos and actually integrate them to the new system. You need to make sure all of your DNS addresses or IP addresses, they don't overlap in any way and you don't have any mix-ups. Uh, other thing is, if you want to import your secrets, you actually cannot import your secrets because they're encrypted with, difference, uh, with different key of different zool. So, but this scenario may, might not be perfect for testing your jobs. However, this scenario is pretty good for testing your zool upgrades. So, it has one advantage. Uh, you can also run zool on a laptop and you can try mocking uh, Notepool part or Garrett part, checking out the code locally to your laptop, later on running some simple Docker slave, which will be a static slave. However, again, you still approach the very same problem. You need to clone your repos, you need to set up your secrets, and um, it's, it's not fully viable. Another scenario is unit testing your roles. So this is something that will not help with secrets at all, However, it will allow you to uh, make, make, make sure that your jobs are passing smoothly. And what I mean by that, if, if you're writing your code and your CI jobs, you can actually treat them in a regular way. So, uh, for example, you want to set up, uh, you want to change something in Docker configuration in Demon JSON file. Uh, you do that in a regular way in some sort of role, and for testing that role, you basically, you can provide a dummy file which will not be daemon json you can change the line you need or template the file you need and see if the exact result is over there so that will be something like unit testing but for your roles but again it only covers the roles not playbooks not jobs it's only a it's only a half solution but i believe it's a solution that everyone should have in place because most of the time, you actually don't need to test secrets. You need to test your jobs, which will probably already have some base jobs with secrets already there. And the last idea, or the last suggestion, is running copies or mocks of jobs. And um, I want to focus on it a little bit more, because normally when you want to open a, uh, a review and you want to use a secret, for example, for uploading your logs, that would be a trusted config repo. Uh, so if you open that review, you basically won't be able to test the secret. However, you can try opening a review to an untrusted repo. And if you, if you want to see how it will work, so normally, uh, normally secrets won't be picked up. However, you can replace those secrets with variables. Basically, instead of, uh, instead of encrypting all of your stuff, you can provide some dummy values. You just need to test and see how they behave. However, there are also tasks that uh, in config project, they basically allow you to run on top of executor directly instead of, uh, instead of the worker nodes. So if you are, if you're required to run something on top of uh, Zool Executor, you basically need to change Ansible host because from untrusted context, you cannot run anything on Executor. And the uh, last part for today is actually uh, stuff we would appreciate to see in Zool. However, we can still live without it. Uh, the first part is uh, matching Executor with its cloud. Uh, we have two environments and we want to expand a little bit more, mostly focused to the public cloud. With current scenario, uh, Zool executors are not aware where do they sit. So they will try to pick up all the jobs and all the IP addresses of worker nodes all over the place. It doesn't matter for them if it's cloud one or cloud two, if it's a private cloud or a public cloud. And our environment is actually in private, uh, uh, in the private network behind firewall, and we do not operate with public IP addresses for our slave pool. And we wanted to change that. And because of that, be because of the fact we cannot differentiate two clouds, we would have to either run all of our executors on top of the public uh, on top of the private cloud, uh, because from the private cloud it will be well available to them. So they will be able to access the private cloud, they will be able to access the public cloud. Public IP addresses are pretty much public. And we wanted to have a scenario like this. We wanted to have 
a very strict saying to them, hey buddy, your cloud is cloud one, run only on top of that cloud because, well, it's easier for us, we don't have to establish any tunnels between two clouds, we don't have to establish any routing and actually the interaction with the infrastructure is limited on our end. Uh, one other part it, it might be actually mm, profitable for is the fact that perhaps in very dispersed environments having Zoo Executor binded locally to a cloud might actually, might actually decrease some sort of timeouts or pings or any, any other issues that you might expect in something like that. And the second thing is matrix build definitions. Uh, this is something we had in Zool 2.5 and uh, if we focus on the part on the left, uh, this is our example configuration we're done today. Basically the difference between all of those three jobs is OpenStack version. Uh, this, is, this is pretty much simple, however when you, when you try to assign the jobs to projects it becomes longer and longer and longer and at the same time you need to have a very, very separate job definitions even though they actually don't differ much. It's only one single variable. And on the right side is uh, my idea, just random thought, how it could look like. Not necessarily how it will look like in Zool 3, but how it could look like in Zool version 3 to actually be able to, you know, say, okay, we want to have some sort of regex matching for the job or some sort of variable matching for the job and because of that we will just provide one variable, the job name will change and we will be happy. Wrapping up, so I hope that uh, one of the takeaways and the first and the most important one would be that Tanks and Fabric has a cool CICB system. Uh, one other thing is we hope that you better know or uh, you better try to do it in uh, in that way or you actually know how to deal with binary artifacts with Zool because it hasn't been trivial for us. Uh, reusing your jobs is the key, however uh, I believe it's not always the key as we proved with the LabNet environment. It, uh, well, it was possible, it just took too much time and too much effort compared to the gains we, we got so simple make files was the key and you can test your job not in the production, so you don't have to merge your code and see how they work before you actually run them. Uh, our future plans. So we want to focus on continuous upgrades of Zool. Right now we actually have two environments and frankly we update them rarely. Uh, we want to run uh, build and unit test jobs inside of containers instead of VMs, so that would be a driver for Notebook. And for third party packaging that Yarek already mentioned, so those are dependencies that we have RPM spec files for and we build them, we want to use Supersedent Pipeline Manager because if we have a lot of reviews coming in, it will basically allow us to build all of the packages we need uh, in a very simple way. Okay, so thank you and I want to invite Yarek actually in here so we can take all of your questions. If there are any. It's good. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Man. Right. So thank you. Well, we have. Uh, we have some swag. So first come, first serve. Uh, few power banks. A uh, few tungsten fabric stickers. Run.